All right. So today we are chatting with Mr. Sean Ruggieri. So Sean is an Emmy Award winning cinematographer specializing in underwater documentaries. So Sean has extensive uh, experience diving cameras and underwater housings. He's also rocked a few submarines, ROVs. Um, but the uh, the way that I met Sean was that he actually joined Red Digital Cinema back in 2007, just before the launch of the Red One. Um, he was working with Red through those years and specialised in both helping camera departments as uh, the cameras were rolled out into the field, but then also, you know, due to his uh, love of underwater, spent an awful lot of time taking those cameras uh, below the depths and then helping with the development of that underwater capability. Uh, the other thing that I probably didn't realize until I was uh, researching Sean was his lengthy IMDb background um, that, you know, gave me a big smile because he worked on, you know, Spider-Man, Gone Girl, Thor, Mindhunter, Game of Thrones, which, you know, is all all very cool. Um, but then obviously his latest adventures have even seen him out on Ocean X when they did their maiden voyage to the Red Sea. And then the other thing that we absolutely have to cover today is, uh, you know, the stuff he does with NASA. So, <coughs> Sean, yeah, absolute legend. Mate, thank you for <laughs> taking the time to be with me today. It's my pleasure, Scott. I, I appreciate you having me on. It's it's oh, glad, dude, to, glad just, to join you. Mate, so excited to have you here. Um, because you know, again, you you're the sort of man that, you know, doesn't mention all these cool things that you do. You're you're as humble as a man can be. Um, but buddy, look, I I I've obviously I I've heard this story, but for for people not listening, um, mate, take me on a journey. Uh, you, you obviously, you know, love of the water as a young man. Talk, mm. talk, me, talk to me about that time. Like what, what was it that, that called you to the ocean? Oh, it's always been calling. Uh, yeah. Since I can remember since I was a little kid, uh, my plan was to be a marine biologist. So everything ocean I could get my hands on any book, any, you know, uh, nature special that was on TV or, or a film I could go watch, um, whether it's Jacques Cousteau or, you know, some of the more local legends and things like that. I just gobbled it up um, be, way before diving. You know, I was out snorkeling in our local waters constantly, try to get out there, you know, weekly, if not every couple days, surfing as much as I could. Just total, total fish, you know, salty <laughs> dog while I was still a puppy, you know. Um, yeah, I, I got to say the marine biology thing. I, I love all the marine biologists I've worked with. And I, I, you know, I have so much respect for the dedication it takes them to get to that place. And then also to continue that work. I knew pretty early on, I was not disciplined <laughs> enough, both school wise and just personality wise to stay in that game, to become a marine biologist. Um, so, not you know, a few departures. Lives. Yeah, it's, I, and I, I still, I study as much as I possibly can because it's personal enrichment and then it leads perfectly into the work I do too. I, I, of course, I want to know my environment when I'm in it. And on top of that, you know, the more you know about what you're filming, let's say underwater, uh, sometimes you could predict behaviors. Sometimes you could, you can know where you are in a certain environment and know what you might find way before you're even starting to look for it. Um, things like that. But that yeah, so didn't become a marine biologist apparently. But yeah, well, look, marine biology is the, is the obvious one. I always uh, thought mm. that you know the idea of being a dolphin trainer would have been pretty cool. Oh, um, that was that that was huge <laughs> to me too. I know I you right know as, as as much as I have this. Um, kind of love hate relationship with you know captive animals and stuff like that as a child Correct. watching dolphin trainers work with the dolphins at the local uh, like oh, sea world man. and stuff it blew my mind and actually That's speaking cool. of that i was i was i was out when i was a kid i was probably about eight nine years old and it was in between show times and i witnessed one of the dolphin trainers playing catch with a ball with one of the dolphins Full and i came down to watch and the trainer was just like Come on over, little guy. You want to try this? Oh, and I got to play catch with a dolphin at like eight or nine years old. And yeah, that was cool. set the hooks in me even more, you know? Uh, and see, we didn't really understand, you know, the animals in captivity thing, you know, mm. 35 years ago. It probably wasn't, sure. you know, as heavily considered. Um, but it was just extraordinary, particularly, you know, with the animals like the dolphins and just watching the way that they would interact with humans and just yeah. how incredible they were. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, those intelligent beings 
um you know being able to be trained for one thing it's you know yes. it, it takes a high level of, of intelligence and it is tough because when you when you have animals that are that intelligent and you know they're aware of their environments it seems even tougher for the heart to to enjoy seeing yeah. them but then there's also the other aspects like i still love going to aquariums and there's a huge role they play when it comes to bringing awareness to people that are never going to take themselves out of those those critters Correct. environments um, and making them care for them. You know, I, I watch, you watch kids fall in love with these, you know, sea lions or whatever they are. Oh. And all of a sudden they care about them. They want to protect them. Totally. They now have a new awareness. And, and it's massive. Um, I actually took my son to the, um, uh, the Antarctic. Uh, so it's the, the base station that they fly out of uh, in New Zealand to actually get you, yeah. get you down there. And they've How actually cool. got um, a, a program there where they, you know, care for penguins in particular ones that can't be re-released into the wild mm -hmm. um, because, you know, they've had an injury or whatever. And so they actually take them there and they care for them and they look after them. Um, and like my son just thought that that was the coolest thing he'd ever seen, um, totally. you know, watching and learning about them there. Yeah. And that's, that's what I love too. Yeah, all of our local aquariums that I know of, that's the majority of their focus. You know, of course they want to present these animals to the public and, and teach them about them, but there it's, it's usually a rescue and rehabilitation and hopefully release yeah. back into the wild type of thing. Absolutely. And then some of them that are never going to be able to make it back in the wild and they end up living there no. and getting and, fat and happy. <laughs> yeah, they're made fat and happy. They give them the best life. There's no predators. Yeah. Like they, they're just having the best time of their lives. They've they've won the uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and couch potato really life. Yeah. yeah, well, it's it's really changed, hasn't it? In, in that sense right. that it is now about you know rescue and rehabilitation, whereas you know it probably was just more entertainment based um, mm. back when we were mm -hmm. young fellas. True. Now, obviously, so the ocean spoke to you, but how did you end up taking pictures? Um, yeah, great segue. Cause it, it really like, as I started to lose, no, I wouldn't say interest, but kind of coming to a realization that I wasn't going to go in the direction of a PhD program or something like that. Um, it was actually, I didn't have any photography classes in my high school, which I really wish I did. But then when I went to, when I first started at college or uni, as you'll typically yeah. say, right. Um, my, my first year there I took my first photography course 101 shooting massive rolls of film developing them and printing you know eight by tens in the dark room and just absolutely exactly. fell in love with that and that was um when i started that my father was you know he was he was an amateur photographer did, did it for his own passion it was his yeah. stuff was more like street photography portrait stuff he handed me down his um his Canon AE-1 that was made in 76. I got the guts oh, rebuilt dude. on it and then just started shooting that thing like crazy. And I was, I was in love, man. And then, yeah, um, an yeah. AE-1. Like, that's just a great camera. I still use it. I love it. Yeah. Like when, when my son was born, that was the first thing I thought I was, okay, got to go get some more rolls of black and white and yeah. start shooting this thing again. <laughs> yeah, I love Can that I camera. <laughs> funny story. I, uh, I've got a Canon 1V. So like their sports, um, uh, film camera, their sports 35 mm -hmm. millimeter camera. And I've actually taken that traveling, you know, with the family and some of my favorite shots that I've ever taken, like I've only got, you know, three or four photos that I've taken out of the hundreds of thousands mm. uh, off that camera, mate. Um, you know, a bit of Kodak Portra 400. Yeah, exactly. Um, yep. yep. Oh, dude. Like I've got photos from when we were last in the States with him, like in, you know, New York and on the, on the steps where uh, Sylvester Stallone's, you know, doing these ones. Yeah, the Rocky um, thing. And, yeah. Oh, man. Cool. And I've got these photos of my wife and this, like, tiny little dude sitting there next to him, like, shot on that camera in Portra. And, like, they're just, they're just special, aren't they? They really are. Yeah, that was the first thing I went and I was like, can I still find plenty of Portra? And, and totally was able to, you know, just online. Yeah. And, yeah, that's what I was shooting my, my newborn son with a bunch too it is special and 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 the process too right of you really having oh, to be much more selective you no know, spray and pray type of scenarios and you're really paying it's attention a, to yeah. setting up the shot yeah it's a good thing to come back to like mm. as a digital shooter and that was actually part of the sure. reason i picked it up again was you know the you know sports photography <clears throat> occasionally you've got to do a little bit of spray and pray when things are happening absolutely um, yeah but, you know, you can get sloppy where you're sort of taking, you know, 2,000 photos a day and going, hang on, mm. this is silly. Whereas <laughs> i got to edit this now. Gonna, yeah. yeah. Could you sort of go, mate, each photo is costing me like $6. Um, you know, I should probably, <laughs> you know, use some care and some diligence. <laughs> totally. Totally. Man, I'm glad you still use that. So you still <clears throat> shoot with the AE1 now? 
Yeah, yeah. Every once in a while, uh, it just reminded me. Now it's probably been a been at least a year or so since I picked it up. I gotta gotta yeah, get back good. on it. Man, time to punch a roll through that thing. <laughs> totally, totally. Uh, yeah. And have you got a housing for it? When did you start putting them underwater? I, I, no, um, yeah, underwater came much later. I mean, for me, the underwater stuff started as simple as you can um, with small point and shoots, you know, really cheap stuff. And then of course uh, with the development of GoPro and those came along, of course I was doing that stuff for a while. And then yeah. about 10 years ago was the first time that I put a red underwater. Um, that was, and that was, sort that was of where it started. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was always so interested in it and total fish at the time anyways. Yeah. Um, but to finally get a professional camera in a professional housing, it was the red one uh, in a Gates underwater products housing, you know, the, the housing they made for the red one. And, and then the, that is how it started and just ignited a hundred percent. You know, I, mm. I knew, I knew right away that, that, that I needed to focus on this. I yeah. That, was, that was the moment. You're yeah, like the window is open. This is it. Like, yeah, go, go, yeah. Go. Now the window's like, open. I'm jumping through it and f- trying to fly like Superman. Man, if I fall, I fall, but I'm just gonna keep going. That's a time I really want to talk to you about because I mm. sort of went, you know, I've I've gone and talked all the way back to your start of your Facebook photos um, <laughs> to you know go back and have a look. And uh, one of the photos I did see was a shot of you on the red one the day before it was shipped to customers. Mm. Because obviously you joined Red before the product came out, you know, back when people were still, you know, poo-pooing and going, oh, this will never work. Sure. Um, you know, you know digital will it ever exist, cinema, period. Mm-hmm. how stupid, who are these idiots? You know, some yeah. bloke that makes sunglasses thinks he can build a, a video camera. Good luck, champ. Um, like, what a time. Like, how did that happen? Yeah. How did you end up yeah. at Red? Yeah, I mean, it's just... Uh, everything you just said right there just flashbacks of like my first years at red all just battling yeah. those type of arguments and conversations um how i ended up at red was i was working i had a full-time job at a small media house uh that's local here in orange county california and i was working as an editor I started there as you know an assistant editor basically logging doing lower thirds on on some of their shows and then eventually moved myself up to uh, editing whole shows and how it happened was they, uh, my boss was going to go to NAB, you know, the National Association of Broadcasters, the big convention we have out here. And he grabbed, I want to say like one or two of the employees from the media house to take with him to Vegas in NAB. And oh. I was not one of them. <laughs> but when they came back, <laughs> all they were talking about was this this company Red. That was 2006 NAB when Red yeah. basically announced themselves, even though they didn't have a product yet. Wait, um, no? And immediately, like I was just eating up all their information. So I just dove in research wise as much as I could and just spent many sleepless nights just researching what's going on, following the forums, Red user. Um, yeah. And realistically, how it happened was I kind of stalked Red and wouldn't leave them alone until they would give me a job. <laughs> I, I, I sent an initial email and um, you know, just said, I can see that this is the future. I, I know where this is going. I know how important this is. I want to be part of it. Um, yeah. And they said, we, we, you know, we really appreciate your passion, but we don't even have a product yet. <laughs> so please stand by. Um, and, you, you know, know hopefully it, sometime in the future. Yeah. And yeah. so, and so realistically, I just kept coming after them, you know, every, every couple months, you know, just for friendly reminder, I'm still here, still interested, uh, being yeah. dedicated to the cause. And eventually they, they brought me in. And after, Three interviews. My fourth interview was sitting down with with Jim Gennard, the the owner and wow. creator of of Red, and we. It was a really inch. It, it, you can't really call it a job interview because it was a conversation, and it was awesome. We we sat down and we just started chatting about digital cameras and digital cinema, and at some point, you know, forty five minutes into the conversation or whatever it was, he said, "Well, so do you want to see the Red One prototype?" Boy. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and went in the back and there was one of the prototypes with one of the heads of engineering and one of the guys, Brent Carter, who had initially set up my interviews, he looked at me, he goes, you know what this means, right? If you're looking at this camera right now, <laughs> I go, does this mean I got the job? <laughs> he goes, yeah, you got the, the job. So. Oh, yeah. So dude. yeah, I was that's employee cool. 21. Yeah. <laughs> was employee wild. number 21. Holy. That's, that, yeah. like, that's madness. Cause that, you know, I've obviously followed all of this very closely um, because mm. I 
I obviously loved what Red did in terms of like just coming in and going, screw you all, mm -hmm. we're doing it our way. Like yep. I really liked that rock and roll approach, which you Me know too. can it needed to happen to the industry. Too. Let's let's be real. But it really it, needed oh to happen. Man, they came in and flipped it on its head. And mm -hmm. Like, tell me about those early days. I mean, mate, you're there testing the camera because there's photos of you, like you've got it um, at the football, you're out, you know, doing things with it. What, what was that time like? I mean, that must have been wild. Yeah. Oh, it was so wild, man. It's, you know, there's no way I could probably keep up with the pace at my age now, but it was a blast then because we <laughs> were, you know, oh, it was, it was a total lifestyle for us. You know, we would, you know, sleep at the office quite frequently, just days and nights, um, yeah. testing stuff and then taking it out to a shoot in the morning. Um, initially I became, uh, one of the first, uh, onset techs for these cameras, um, while also helping start to develop the internal tech support department that hired me to, to be tech support and customer service. And so I started yeah. developing that de department with, with Brent and a couple others, and then yeah. going out to sets and trying to support these cameras being on set, both for the reason that it's brand new technology. So yeah. realistically, it's the first time, you know, you've got all these working professionals that may have been in the industry for decades. However, oh, yeah. it's something they've never had their hands on. So yeah. they need a bit of guidance, but also to be real, those, those out there that were with red in the very early days know that it, there were some struggles. I mean, it was, oh, you know, yeah. like, like people say, bleeding at bleeding edge technology. I mean, there was, Correct. there was so much going on in these tiny cameras that of course you're going to have some issues and, you know, development oh, was yeah. happening so fast. So <clears throat> I was there to try to help fix these issues on set. And the way I yeah. see it too, I was also there to take some of the heat off of, the camera department that was on the productions as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Be, be someone and talk to that to guy get from Red. Yeah. Oh, wasn't I, they, I, I was the red guy. Yeah, where is, the red guy. Where's the effing red guy? Yeah. yeah, where's he, mate? You you were the punching guy. He's right guy. behind you. Yeah. 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 So that was, all, that was all part of the job, you know, but that was worth it. But there like, were some wild days. And, oh, man. that it, Like, it's just such a hardcore story, you know, mm. to and have to be been in there, you know, on – you know, that coal face as that technology was rolled out yeah. because, you know, how did you find the resistance? Like, how did you find people going this, you know, this <sighs> digital rubbish? Like, it, yeah, it was tough. I mean, for one thing, 4k was never going to be a thing to people in their mind. I mean, 1080 was plenty. And I mean, look yeah. at where we are now where 4k oh, is yeah. possibly not enough for most people. Um, I'll tell you how I found the resistance. Um, so, I'll, tell you, I'll try to make it a quick story, but one of the first yeah. sets I ever went out on, and I know I could tell this story publicly because I've actually read an article where the director told the same story, um, yes. slightly different from where I, the way I remember it, but it's okay. <laughs> um, it, it was it was uh, Gamer with Gerard Butler, and this had to be 2007, yeah. I believe, um, is when they started shooting it. And so first day of production, this sequence is, and it's the very first sequence they're going to shoot of the entire movie. And it's Gerard Butler's stunt double running down an alley, an explosion goes off next to him and, you know, blows him to bits, it looks like. But then the director, who's, they're amazing, Neville Dean Taylor, they like to camera operate themselves a lot. And so he okay. was in a full fire retardant suit and complete, oh, you know, done up. And he's going to run through the fireball after the stunt double with the camera and then reveal that, you know, Gerard Butler's okay and goes on yeah. with the fight. So basically they run down the alley, explosion goes off. They're both running through a fireball. You know, like I said, he's in a fire retardant uh, outfit. The camera is wrapped in like a plastic bag from what I remember, like a, oh, literally dude. like a, like a throw over <laughs> trash bag when, when it rains um, the camera cuts off during the explosion. Um, so oh, immediately, no. yeah, immediately there's panic and like, wait a minute, it uh, can't take the concussion of things like this, this entire mm. movie, if you've ever seen it, the entire movie is explosions, gunfights and things like that. So yeah. if this camera can't take this, it's not going to work. Let's do it again. Runs through the explosion, cuts off. They do it a third time. It cuts off again. If, I, if I'm remembering the amount of times and basically yeah. the producers came to me right then and said, okay, so this is the thing we're going to break for lunch. You need to look at your camera, figure out what's going on with it. We're going to try this one more time after lunch. If that camera fails again, we're pulling the 435s off of the truck. And this film is now going to be shot on film. And one yes. of the first major movies for Red is not oh, going to be shot on Red anymore. No. I'd already... No yeah, no pressure. No pressure at all. I mean, dude, there's a reason why I have so much gray hair of what hair is left. Oh, but, um, <laughs> but I already had voiced my concern and what I thought it was. And it yeah. didn't seem like it wanted to be listened to. But 
long story short is back then with red ones, if anybody remembers them, there was also a side record button right here. And I uh, was saying that I think that's smashing against the operator's face when the explosion's uh, going off. Uh, uh, so basically we put a bunch of gaff tape over that thing at lunchtime. They came back, they shot it one more time. The camera didn't cut out because that side record button was taped over uh, and they watched the playback and everybody just uproar cheering. Oh my God, it's beautiful. It looks so great. Oh, uh, and yeah so the movie went on being shot on red you know that night we popped off all the side record buttons which leads to later wow. on a development in the camera software where you can go into the menus and disable that side record button of so course. the trial by fire uh r d is really what it was oh. right like you're you're figuring Dude. out how to develop these things in the middle of a war zone <laughs> kind of do you know all you've done there is you've gone on to confirm that gaff tape <laughs> does indeed fix everything <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Mate, what absolutely. would we do without gaff tape and zip ties? That's the truth. Oh, dude, that's... that is that is actually ridiculous. I mean, because that's the sort of stuff. I mean, that's you know, that's that's pressure when it's just your set mm. and you know something's playing up. But when it's yeah. your technology on you know a Hollywood film and and everybody's looking at you like people want you to yeah. fail in the early days. Like they don't they don't want to see Very the young upstart get up. You know, yeah, they, they want true. their, their poo pooing to come true for, for God knows what reason. Yeah. Like, I mean, most people just brutal. couldn't, just wanted the excuses to be able to make it go away and go back to doing yeah. things the way digital stuff uh, they used we to. We want film. Yeah. And, oh, you know, and man. so I, I love like the ongoing early quotes and, and things that Jim, the, the founder, would always say is, mm. you know, the, we all knew that digital was going to end up taking over film. Maybe not absolutely entirely, but it was going to take over yeah. a lot of the industry. So one of his main missions was to give it a respectful replacement, you know, not saying that, right. okay, 1080, 24 P that's going to be sufficient. And that's a great replacement for how this beautiful 35 millimeter plus film has, has Correct. trained us to see cinema our whole lives, you know? So yeah. the whole point was, well, if it's going to happen, let's, let's make it happen beautifully. You know, let's give it a proper, yeah. a, a proper next step. And see, that is a lovely way because, you know, my understanding of, uh, of Jim, again, not somebody I've met personally, but you know, from things I've read that he's written is, you know, he's obviously a very passionate, you know, photographer, cinematographer himself. Yeah. And he, he did, he really did do his best to to translate all of that in into the company that he founded like that that sort of formed the ethos didn't it absolutely yeah yeah i mean he was he's a really talented photographer and he uh, a lot of people didn't know it, but a lot of the um ad campaigns for oakley he shot them himself both stills and, and motion campaigns um and i remember him telling me that story and i know i've heard it a couple other times is where it, it almost the, the company was almost created out of a frustration of how he would buy the the leading technology from one of these big camera companies and then three months later it was like well now we've got something better but mm -hmm. you know you it's there was no upgrade paths or anything like that like red offered so it was it yeah. was like well this has to change and he's going to be the one to change it himself. he had the means yeah because see i had i had read that he shot a lot of his own campaigns and i mean a lot mm -hmm. of the ugly stuff is so iconic you know i, yeah. I was yeah shaped by Oakley as a brand as a young man in the nineties, you know, mm. I had my sweet wraparounds. Like I was all yeah. about like their style was just so cool. And mm. I think that that was one of the things that I really liked that they carried into the camera company. You know, it, it, it wasn't just, you know, the Germans or the Japanese where it's just absolute, you know, precision in what they do. And it's mm. very toe the line. Like I really, the rock and roll style. I, I, I think that's the only thing I can ever relate it to. Totally. Um, yeah, I always favorite. called us. I always called us a bunch of punk rock bands smashed yeah. into a small room, oh, you man, know, with with the product as punk rock as I could see. Because yeah. the 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 evolution that you know I truly fell in love with was the Red Epic. Um, like, talk to me about the transition from like you know the Red One to the Epic. Like, how mm. how was that? Obviously, it was a natural progression, but I mean, it felt like you know not just you know a bit cheesy, but not evolution, but full revolution. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it was a big jump. Um, I just know when it came to internally with development wise, without me, you know, just saying anything I shouldn't, but 
yeah. things were really focused on trying to make everything smaller, of course, more efficient, but also even better quality. You know, that was never going to be a sacrifice. It was always, you know, let's let's up the ante when it comes to the quality of what we can deliver. But how can we make this smaller um, and even cheaper at times, too? Right. But um, when the Epic bodies were being developed, if you remember that, that point in time, 3D had its big revolution. So yes. that became a requirement out of the gate that need this mm. because the red ones were starting to be used on these big uh, beam splitter 3D rigs yeah. uh, were just enormous, massive things. Those, those are the I things of my nightmare because uh, as if things aren't as complicated enough, now you've got two cameras instead of one with twice the cabling and GAC and accessories yeah, yeah. and all the other stuff involved. Um, so is- the epics had to be these smaller boxes that worked into the 3D world better which for a lot of us worked into many of our worlds, the underwater yeah. industry working into a housing, of course. It'll, you know, it'll when it came to the gimbal sense. revolution and, and steady cam revolutions and, you know, putting them on car mounts and things like this, oh, it, everything just had a, it had an advantage in that direction. Well, it did. The, the smaller, lighter and faster, um, you know, became the whole thing. But look, we're probably mm. jumping forward a little bit here because you've got to tell mm. me a little bit about, so obviously, you know, Red and Gates was a really strong partnership and that started with mm-hmm. Red One. Like how, how far into the journey was that? Um, well, they met, um, you know, I work really closely with Gates and the owner, John Ellibrock, owns company with with his, his wife, Karen. Um, he's told the story numerous times that uh, I've heard where he was introduced to the company and introduced to Jim at the 2006 NAB yeah, presentation, right. the the big unveiling um, of what we will be may not have a product yet, but here's some machined prototypes and, um, and they, you know, they seems like they hit it off and they're like, okay, you're, you're, you're the underwater guy. Let's, let's start working closely. Well and done. still to this day, you know, there's a really tight relationship between red and gates when it comes to um engineering and development of products so um they're working really closely with their product development team which is a really brilliant team that red has at this point right now too um absolutely yeah how how did you insert yourself into that conversation because obviously you went hey i like the ocean stuff yeah camera ocean me let me be the glue that holds those together how how did you manage to (laughs) jump yourself in there I guess it would kind of be, kind of be similar to the way I got the job at Red was just yeah, gotcha. barged just my push, way push, in push. and said, I, I'm taking yep. this. Hello. I want this. I want, um, yeah. You mean? But it, it was such a passion for me that, too, that <clears throat> I was already trying to network with, you know, I'd speak with hundreds, if not, you know, thousand people, uh, you know, every couple days to a week that were out there shooting reds. And when it was somebody that was out shooting nature docs, um, the natural history stuff always really was interesting to me. I might spend a little extra time on the phone with them, you know, and picking their brain and, and supporting them. So I was already building a network of those folks folks before I was even really getting involved in it myself. Before you were the guy, you were, you were like, I can see Hmm. which way I want this to go. Yeah. That, and, you know, I could tell that, Red works brilliantly for so many parts of the the industry, um, and yeah. I knew, yeah, sports, sports and stuff like that too. But I knew, like nature, this is nature's oh. baby. This is what they want. It's oh, small. Man. It's That's really crazy. high definition with the beautiful picture, but also the high frame rates that weren't being offered on other cameras, which is it's just an absolute massive. must for nature stuff. Yeah. Because, yeah, who, mate, who the hell wants to be working a big film camera out in the jungle or attempting to – I've seen some of the big boxes where they've tried, you know, film cameras underwater and stuff. I don't know if that's yeah. correct, but, oh, man. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I'd love to touch on that because, yeah, in my earliest days, so, you know, John Elbrock, owner of Gates, is, is one of my really close friends to this day, but also mm-hmm. a mentor to me. And he introduced me to a lot of folks, including Bob Cranston, rest in peace, Bob, legend. Um, mm. and he was a big, big pioneer, um, of digital filmmaking underwater and 3d as well. So Bob Cranston and Howard Hall, two of the biggest names in the industry, and they were close working partnership for a long time and they would shoot IMAX film beam splitter 3d rigs underwater. And if I remember mm. right, the things were like, I think I remember Bob saying they were about 1200 pounds 
Uh, I'm sorry. I'm pounds over here in the States, whatever KG that is. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, you got these big, big cranes that you'd have to bring it into the water with Bob and Howard would be on rebreathers down there. They get, you know, a minute or whatever, a few seconds of roll time. And then they'd have to send the rig back up with a diver to get the film reloaded. And then it would have to come back down with a new diver. So they weren't getting anybody bent and, you know, decompression sickness. Yeah. So they'd have to switch out their support. So all that fast forwards then to the Gates version of this yes. is a beam splitter rig for the epics and yeah. you know 1200 pounds went to about 300 pounds but tiny you know you're talking about the the old imax rigs were the size of like a vw beetle something like that you yeah know? just silly and and that's what i'd seen was like these things were just monstrous and you know it's mm. one thing on a on a set where you've got explosions going off and you know it's all a bit but for for people working in that nature documentary they'd just be like going oh you, you've you've saved me what a whole new set of logistics right and just it, and it and those type of things just really limit your possibilities you have well, to start do. work working around the limitations and versus yeah. what would be a perfect thing to shoot and how to shoot it but we can't you know yeah because it, it just won't work and, and i guess that would have been so obviously you did get you had the red one underwater mm -hmm. yep and and how did how did that go how did that go like the first times you know you you took it uh, I mean, I was, I was fixated on it immediately. It went great. Um, that was by the time I got the red one underwater. It was right when Gates was finishing development on a housing for the Epic. Right. And so I was lucky enough to get a transition really quickly into that, and it led to me making the first of a series of videos I did for Red. Um, where it was basically before the camera comes out or right after it comes yeah. out, get it underwater. And it's the first ever seen underwater footage of these cameras, kind of a test case scenario. Mm -hmm. And that was the, the, the first one I did for them. I called it Water Breathing Dragon. And it was with Bob Cranston and Johnny mm -hmm. Friday, who is a close friend as well. And we went out to the local island here, Catalina. Mm -hmm. And we were trying to find the uh, opalescent squid spawning. And we just... Uh, uh, it, the trip was close to over and then we just landed right on it and just you're talking <laughs> about these squids spawning by the billions oh, um man. shooting it both in day and night and it was just the most surreal mind-blowing thing i've ever seen and that i was already hooked the second i was started shooting underwater but that oh, yeah. trip right there and that shoot and then me coming back and i edited it myself you know and tried to direct oh, yeah. the whole piece myself that's when i knew well this is this is what i'm gonna do this is it you yeah. know that i just went to this i just went to outer space in my mind and yep. and I, this is where i want to keep going back to you're like this is it this is my jam and yeah. like what a time so you know the start of the epic because the epic i think was the time when red you know really transformed from you know some new whiz bang good luck to you to hang on a second mm. like this there's, you know, not mucking around here. Because yeah. the thing that I remember, um, because I, like I was shooting motorsport at that time and I went over to, you know, the American series Formula Drift. They were doing uh, stuff in Southeast Asia. And one of the dudes who was shooting there um, had his Red Epic in like 2010 shooting drifting. And like drifting, you know, it's, it's not considered top tier motorsport here. You know, again, it's a bit rock and roll. Um, and like, I just, mm. I remember watching him work and watching the, the footage that that camera produced and, you know, I'm, I'm just there banging around with my stills camera. And I remember looking at that tiny little camera package and then what he was producing with it and going, mm. man, you know, one day, like That's one it. day. Yeah. Yeah. You know where you were going. Yeah, for sure. Oh man. It was just like, it was the, just the, what they, what they could make with it. Like the, the quality and the style and the look. It was just like nothing I'd ever seen and having, you know, again, having a small camera package that was like portable, but also just the highest quality, you know, you could achieve. Cause you think about like an Alexa back then, I mean, man, it, it was like a Bessa, Bessa block with a lens on the front of it. Mm, like yeah. that, that is not something that you'd take to the local drift track to film some cars, you know, at high frame sure, rate, sure. you know, blazing past you at a hundred K an hour. 
all like goes to the was... typical shoulder mount. But yeah, I mean, it became a whole oh, new style man. of shooting where people did this kind of right to the chest and, you know, yeah, that type of thing. You, like, yeah, yeah, you get it in there and you, yeah. Yeah, you, you're in with the action, but you're in there, you know, with a cinema camera. And that was mm. when I remember like Red Bull started, you know, shooting stuff with it and they were doing like extreme sports stuff with it. And this was probably closer to 2012 or thereabouts. Um, and mm-hmm. like, I just remember seeing like wild stuff being done. It was all still, you know, a little bit out there in traditional land, but I've never been super interested in traditional land. I've always yeah. liked, you know, that, that bleeding edge stuff and where that goes. Cause that would have been, yes, when, man. you know, in, and in terms of your work on sets, um, you know, where it was being, cause what was Spider-Man was 2012 ish, wasn't it? Or thereabouts was that Epic? or oh, God. it all bleeds remember. together. It was Epic. Yeah. It was, it was yeah. actually one of the, I want to say it was before that. Cause it was one of the very first shows the epics were on. And I mean, this was the earliest days of development in them and they immediately had to work on 3d beam splitter rigs. And the, you know, there was constantly like four rigs working at once, if not more. Um, yeah. that, yeah, I don't know how that didn't kill a lot of us, but myself and, <laughs> and Nate Hart spent a lot of, uh, time on that set too. And we would basically go work 12, you know, sometimes 14 hour days or whatever it was on set and uh, come yeah. up with the list of maybe, maybe issues we saw, but a lot of times more so just things that need to be integrated into the software, things that need to change, yeah. things that are just going to help the workflow on set. And as we're sending that in while we're on set, the engineers are developing this new software. We get done with our big long day on set and then we go back to the lab, pop in the new firmware and then retest the things we saw happening there and, and, you know, sleep never. So speaking of Red Bull, there was a lot of Red Bulls that happened. But like, (laughs) that's just, that's wild times. Like that really is like, it's still, as I, say, as I said, like that, that is young man's work. You know, that is not something, totally. you know, going from film sets to the lab to back. Yeah. To back again. There was, man, there was so much energy that was created though, because we knew what we were doing too. And yeah. um, of course the pressure of the situation is going to keep you awake no well, matter what, but also it was just, we all just had so much drive and passion for the company yeah. that it was, you know, just, it just, just it kept us going. Mm-hmm. Oh man. Like it, it, it just blows me away. You know, hearing all these stories um because you know as i sort of said you know i was just a whippersnapper trying to find my feet and you know obviously you're watching all these things from afar um you know that are going on it it... now with the r d i also saw that you were pivotal in assisting the development of the underwater olpf Um, do you you want to tell me a little bit about that how that sort of came to be as you went underwater and you went oh hang on a sec yeah that was that was definitely an obsession for at least a few years um yeah and do- dove into a bunch of studies that, you know, were, were new to me. And I've mentioned it before and love to mention again that I had the guidance of some really smart people out there, um, like Dave Blackham from Esprit Films and, and, and John Shaw over in your neck of the woods. Um, mm-hmm. he, he's, yeah, he's an Aussie. And these folks were already doing the early work that was leading me in the right direction of what we were trying oh. to solve was, especially with Dragon the dragon sensor in epic you ended up getting a uv cross contamination in right. in in blue water or in uh, you know it, it's when you when you're shooting underwater everything changes and one of the most important things is is as you go deeper you know after you are a couple meters deep there's zero red light left from the spectrum it's filtered out by the water um, and as you go deeper and deeper, right, the different colors of the spectrum disappear. That's why when we look down into water, we see blue typically. That's yeah. not because the water's blue. It's because that is the most color that will penetrate that deep into really? that water through the light. Yeah. So basically everything else is filtered out down at depth besides the blue. Oh, That's yeah. the only thing left. Um, so it's, I'll try not to go off on too much of a tangent on this man, I love this. nerd, right. nerd hey. based tangent, but, oh, but man, yeah, basically. Yeah. What would happen is this crystal clear blue water, especially that of like the Caribbean and things like this. And, and yeah. really, if it had a bit of sediment in it to it, I highlighted it is that water would turn a bit magenta ish. Everybody started calling mm-hmm. it the dreaded, the dreaded magenta issue. And it wasn't mm-hmm. just a red thing. Uh, it wasn't just yeah. a red thing, but a uh, CMOS sensor thing in general. And it seemed like dragon struggled with it more than any of the sensors we had gotcha. before or since. 
Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, basically we ended up developing this optical low pass filter with that system. You know, you could unscrew the optical low pass filter and put in a new one, depending on what effect you wanted out of it. Um, yeah. And this one had um, a UV cut at a certain point in the spectrum and a couple other secret sauce little tidbits thrown into it that would help kind of remedy this issue um but again some of this was done by me following the footsteps of people that went before me and were using these uv cut filters i would yeah. start i would you know it was terrible terrible part of the job where red had to send me out to cayman islands to go on a dive trip for well, a week and no, i would sample these I mean, different filters like you can test. i mean you can't do this in the swimming pool can you yeah no not at all you know, you, it had to be it had to be, be done Okay, guys, I'll take this one for the team. I'll oh, go God. out, go out on a dive trip to Cayman Islands, and and but then I would send this data back, you know, after diving all day, and you know, sometimes shooting fun stuff to try to come up with a proof of concept video to put out, but also you know, I'm shooting yeah. chip charts, shooting color charts, and things like that underwater, to then that evening send back to our engineers and our color scientist Graham Natras, absolute brilliant mind, and he would yeah. he would mix it into his magical cauldron and figure out solutions mathematically for it and and apply that to to basically what the the hardware engineers could put into a physical yep. piece of hardware that optical low pass filter but then also at the same time he was figuring out how to uh, change the color science that he is applying of in course. camera um to I both optimize that. the good characteristics and to make sure we're kind of uh, negating some of the ones we wanted to get rid of. And see, that's wild. And I, I think one of the other things I've always really loved about Red is how people, you know, like Graham, you know, are, are really involved, you know, in the community and speak about what they do. And like a no one, you know, it's not just the R&D department that you hide in the basement. Um, it, it's how mm. active these, you know, all, all these people yeah. are and how critical they've been, you know, in, in working together. Because again, you know, without you doing that work and without the people that, you know, came before you and, but, you know, you all bring it together and you do it in, I guess, such a collaborative fashion. Um, and you're mm. going to tell me, did, like, how many, how many goes did it take till you went, oh, this is about right. I mean, what's, what's the, what's the time period? Uh, I mean, I can't even imagine what Graham went through and then our other, you know, the other folks in our engineering team, because that's where all the, the the work really ended up happening. I was out there collecting the data um, and try to present them the worst case scenarios I could and then best case scenarios. And mm -hmm. then they did the, the computing, if you will. You know, they did the real math and the, and the real work to figure out, okay, what are we seeing? Why are we seeing this get better? Why are we seeing this get worse? And then mm -hmm. over time, um, you know, it, it took a couple of years and, you know, I want to say like I, I started really concentrating on that project. And by the time we had release of one, it was almost about a three year period. Um, wow. But it was, you know, going and doing sample images with these off the shelf filters that we knew were yep. helping improve. And then going back then with our prototype of what we thought was going to work and, and bringing that all back to the lab and figuring out, you know, did we get it? Did we nail it? Um, but fast forward, you know, I know that those filters I've been told help play a big part in some of the biggest BBC blue chip underwater stuff that, you know, was kind of the big re revolution. I feel like we had a big, big re revolution, like with blue planet two and around that time, oh. you know, and, yeah. and planet earth, planet earth two and all that stuff where, oh, yeah. um, well, you, you got, got so much more interest here. again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, nothing they do is easy, but hopefully we hopefully we helped improve oh. it a tiny bit and could check one and, thing and note off the, the list. The easy, easy er. Because what's right, crazy right, right. is yeah. me as me as somebody who like has enough trouble with cameras, you know, above the water. The only thing I ever think about is like how how you'd not get water in the housing. That's like mm. I I never think about anything beyond that because I look <laughs> yeah, at going yeah. putting this thing in a housing, then taking it underwater, and I'm like, dude, if it gets like two drops in there, it's game over. Um, yeah, so yeah. I've I've never really even gone into the depth because I'm too scared to even, you know, uh, unless it's a GoPro and like you've bought the housing for it. And I'm like, oh, look, I can do with, you know, if I burn 500 bucks, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, you have a similar yeah. viewpoint to most people who are cinematographers, yeah. working professionals, honestly. And and sometimes that's Terrifying. I have to I have to walk folks through some steps at times because like with me, I, I 
I don't rent my housing and my camera gear out without me going at least as a housing tech, if I'm not being hired as a camera operator. And immediately that is the initial perception is like, right. Okay. Because we don't want to flood it. You don't want to, you don't want us to mess up your camera or your housing. Well, that's, I could teach you how not to do that pretty quickly, but even if that doesn't happen, there are a million other little things that will blow your shoot because you just, haven't done this over and over and you haven't gone through the trial yeah. and errors. You don't have the experience. And, you know, and yeah. And that's, as you said, you know, it's that baptism of fire where, you know, you've just done so much of it where things have gone wrong and you've gone, ah, I know a workaround. Mm, yeah. That's, I, I, I definitely <laughs> can't say I've seen it all and I don't want to see it all. Hopefully <laughs> but I've seen some weird things happen. Yeah. Oh man, I I can honestly only imagine, and um, like the launch of uh, well, actually, before I go there, there's one other thing I wanted to touch on with you, the Red Collective videos. Mm. Now, if if I recall correctly, you you had a uh, a pretty big hand in in the making of the Red Collective videos. Do do I have yeah, a, an accurate a handful of them? Yeah, I I didn't go out on all of them, but <clears throat> some of the, some of the greatest times I read for me, yeah. Um, uh, the first one I did with the crew was uh, Andy, Brandy Casagrande. We did, I believe that was the first yeah. one I did with them. Um, then we did one on Paul Nicklin, and then we did one on who we called the Wilds, Shannon and Russ. Um, and yeah, that one we went to, you know, we spent a week in Komodo National Park out in Indonesia filming Komodo dragons, and then spent the next week in Borneo. Um, optically hunting orangutan and yeah so, that yeah. it was definitely one of the most grueling hard shoots like dirtiest gnarliest nastiest most uncomfortable thing ever and greatest time ever too at the same time it was it was oh, such nice. a fun shoot but a lot of a lot of grueling environments but it was a blast yeah and i think wow. it's beautiful too Mate, it is, because I've got to tell you, like, as as somebody that was, you know, just getting serious about, you know, taking part in that ecosystem, those Red Collective videos in particular, like, mate, they were a massive inspiration to me in those early days. I was like, dude, I want my own Red Collective video. Like, you know, that was like, if, if you could work your way into a point where they, like, actually wanted to yeah. make something about what you do, I'm like, man, that's that's like the pinnacle. That is so cool. Because they I were just know. so special. Because I watched they that. They were. And it was just, Man, it was just creators like doing their thing and, mm. you know, taking the tools and then doing what mattered to them. And I'm like, this is just yeah. amazing. And, and it was always a big focus of ours to not ever make it feel like a commercial for Red. To not no. like we never even prompted people to talk about the product or things no. like that. If that came up organically because they wanted to talk about something that makes their life easier, better or has helped them achieve something, that's great. But it was really about telling their story. And then you're gonna see you're gonna see some of the footage that they've shot in their career with the camera. It sells itself because you know you don't need to you know. I, and to me, like it's, it was such a brilliant marketing device, but it was so much more than that, you know. It and and telling some of those certain stories was similar to you know telling pieces of the red story, you know, because there's so many it of is. you all out there, in, yourself included, that just have these brilliant stories. And it's, that's what created Red. You know, it's, it's the community. Yeah. It, it's both, the mad passion. Like exactly yeah, the same totally. with you, the dude that just wouldn't go away until you got a job. Like right. You just, yeah. you just want to, and th- that was the thing that I think really drew me into it as well, was I'm like, these people, like, it, it, I don't know, it was so much more, like it was less about the gear and more about the creator and, mm. you know, enabling the creator to just go out and do their thing. And I just love that. Like that, that series was so inspirational for me. Like you've got no idea how many times I watched and rewatched every single one of those videos. Like, you know, look, before I'd even met you. Um, yeah. Like fully obsessed oh, cool. because I'm like, this is, you know, burning into my brain, you know, that, that level of work going, man, this is where I want to go. Mm, love yeah. it. Love it. It, it worked. Yeah, like, just a wild <laughs> ride. Cause you yeah. know, DSMC two came along. That was where I sort of jumped into the red ecosystem. So mm-hmm. I was, I was part of the, um, uh, the helium upgrade when that, you know, I'd, I'd put money down and then they went, Hey, guess what? We're making this 8k thing. And I'm like, sweet baby Jesus. I don't even know what I'd do with 8k, but man, I want <laughs> but that. But I think I need it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm like, I totally want that. And they gave us, um, like, uh, it was a super, like it was a discounted price to jump up to that camera because we'd put our deposit mm-hmm. in so early. 
Yeah, I but like yeah. I've just got to I've got to tell you this story because I've got to share this with you. Um, Please. Because obviously, like it was full blown <laughs> madness for me to buy that camera at that point in time. Um, because like I have no film training, I didn't know how to use one. I I like I'd never used one. I literally had just you know watched people use them and gone. I just want that. Like I'm like if you if you want to work with the best, you know you got to aim for that and you got to you know try to use the best tools that you can put in your hand. Sure. And that was it. Like you know absolute madness. Like no no true. Yeah. Yeah, like it, it was all just emotion. It was the vibe, <laughs> which is, which is, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> it seems little... like it worked out though, <laughs> you know. But that's the thing. <laughs> it's, worked out, if... <laughs> it's worked out pretty good. Yeah, and that's the thing is, yeah, a, a tool is a tool, right? But if yeah, you have the is. passion, you have the drive, and you have the the creativity and know how, you are going to put that tool to work to make oh, beauty. Man. You know. That's, yeah. it's going to happen. And that was the whole thing was I got it. And then I'm like, all right, well, I can't embarrass myself with this. <laughs> and, you know, that was how I got in, you know, I did reducation and that was, mm. you know, uh, I met, you know, uh, Steve and John who, who came out to Australia and ran that for us. And one of the craziest things that happened at that, and this is, you know, a lot of my story is because of, you know, my time there was I was at reducation with, you know, those, those wonderful fellas teaching us how to use the camera and sitting next to me was this dude, um, yeah, Tim Bonathan. And, oh, and I'm, yeah. like, I'm like, I, how do I – because he was yeah. telling me about the surfing stuff he did. And, like, back in – I think it was 1998 or 99, I can't remember. It was, like, Biggest Wednesday was the film that he produced. And, again, you know, I'm a bit of a – you know, a bit of a beach bum surfing myself. Yeah. And Matt, I remember watching Biggest Wednesday. I was staying up at Clander. I was at the beach and like me and one of my dudes were like, we're there watching this thing. And I'm like, holy shit. Like imagine shooting, mm -hmm. you know, waves, like just the craziest thing I've ever seen. And then sitting next to me in that room, you know, 15 years later, is the man that made the film that I was watching as a teenager. Yeah. I guess it to be probably the biggest biggest legend in filmmaking history i mean we maybe have to take bruce brown endless summer version yeah. you know that that older oh, version out of the like, scenario was... but it's like yeah tim is an and, like, absolute still legend it out now. like the man's killing you know, it the man is killing a weapon it. Mm -hmm. and I, I was and and this is what happened with my you know my dive into the red world was like just the craziest stuff kept happening because what it did was for somebody you know that sort of had no no path into that world. It, it opened doors that didn't exist previously. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I found myself, you know, in a room with people that, you know, knew what they were doing, knew what they were talking about. And, you know, by osmosis, like you start to learn because you start, you know, everyone was so, everyone was so cool with it. Like there yeah. was no, and, and, you know, I know this is different depending on personalities, but there was no sort of real pulling of rank. People were just, they were all high level creators that just wanted to make beautiful work. And I love that. Like, I love that so much. And that was, you know, I, I think that was one of the things that really, you know, really pushed me was that, you know, I'm like, I want to do, you know, I want to respect these tools and, you know, again, do beautiful work with this stuff. Yeah. That's but, not a, that's not a one-off story too. Cause I love that you had that experience. And, and, and I know some people that went to education multiple times, not because yeah. they'd forgotten what they learned or, you know, wanted to just brush up or see what they could learn new, but also from the networking perspective, oh, I watched so much networking happen through that program. Uh, totally. It's, it's really cool. Like just, it's just, it's, it's such a commitment to, again, you know, to, to buy into that ecosystem so the people that are there, and it's the thing that I've come to appreciate in, you know, any world I've spent a lot of time in and, you know, motorsport and musical theater, hilariously are two of the places I've spent a lot of time. And and the people that are at the pinnacle of those things, like there, there's nowhere else they'd rather be. And it's exactly the same in terms of, you know, operators, cinematographers. Again, I, I'd say it to anyone that'll listen, you know, it's a complex life choice. Um, so, you know, if you've had the capacity to turn that into something that pays your way, like you're all in, you are fully committed. You know, you are mm. not there for the, for the stroke of the ego. You are there because mm. there is nothing else in this world that you would rather be doing. Absolutely. Yeah. You, and you wouldn't, you wouldn't make it past the first few months if it wasn't oh, for man. the right reasons, right? The first couple <laughs> knockdowns, if you will, and things like that, because yeah, they'll happen. Yeah. 
Oh, dude. Yeah. It, you have to be all in it, with the heart for sure. Yeah, because the learning curve was exponential. And look, one of the things I've got to jump to that is, you know, around that sort of time, um, mate, working with David Fincher, Mindhunter, you, mm. you, you got to, mate, how was that <laughs> experience? Because I watch yeah. something that I love about his work. And again, you know, I can watch at a distance, so I don't have to deal with anything else. Um, but like the precision that <laughs> yeah, that man chooses to work with. It's a good, it's good word to use because he's got to be the most precise uh, film director I've ever worked with and, you know, notorious yeah. for it. Yeah, I spent a lot of time uh, around him, with him. Um, and, you know, from House of Cards, I worked on multiple seasons there, Gone Girl, um, uh, Girl with the Dragon Tattoo a little bit. And, yeah. and then, yeah, Mindhunter was out there for a bit of that as well. Um, he is... An absolute genius. I mean, there's yeah. no, well, no other way to put it. You know, every, oh. there's there's so many stories that go around about how tough it might be to work for him because it is a very precise vision and it will be executed um, the way he needs it to be done. And But then also, even if, you know, I, I'm working with some of these crews that are like, I am miserable working on this show. You know, you come to a week or two later and they're like, I've never been better at my job than I ever <laughs> than I am um, right now because David's helped get me there. Yeah, he, he's, mate, he, he, he whips yeah. you into line. It was yeah, like, yeah. one, one of the oh man, one of the things that blew me away that I read was um, you know, there was a curb um in, mm. in one of the shots and it had, you know, an, an access part so that you know an, an yeah. all abilities access. And yeah. he actually had that cloned out because at that point in time the the curb wouldn't have looked like that. Yeah, because of uh, disability act, the ADA is what yeah. we call it in America, the Disability Act, where basically now every sidewalk has to have some yes. kind of ramp going down for wheelchair access, and that's the thing. Maybe some folks would never even think about that, but even if they no. thought about it, they're like, "Well, I'm not going to change that. How much time no. and money is that going to spend?" But that's every single aspect of something. But you know, there, there's there's something truly special about him because his his vision is so precise but also it's so well thought out all the way down the line to where like somebody yeah. could ask him the most random question because something just changed something fell over or something broke or the lighting just changed and a major decision needs to happen and anybody else they'd be like uh david this happened what do we do about this and anybody else would have to look at it process okay let me think he has an answer immediately. It's like, I, I watched him do that multiple times where somebody would ask him a question and no matter how complex the situation, he would fire off an answer so immediately that you just knew everything is so well thought out and precise yeah. in his vision and how he wants everything executed that he doesn't have to think about anything. It just, it comes natural. And that's, yeah, he's, great, he's a wizard. Yeah. And, and I think that that's the best bit about, you know, getting to be around these sort of people is getting to watch their work and watch their style and watch mm. how they, you know, watch what influences them and watch what drives them. And sure. that was where I, I, I also had to ask you about, you know, you, you're obviously involved on set um, with Game of Thrones and you, you've got to tell me a little bit about what it was like to be <laughs> part of, you know, I mean, that's modern day epic, you know, modern day, just totally phenomenal is storytelling that was yeah. real game-changing stuff i mean that's like when the sopranos came out or the wire or you know like yeah. beautiful long form just gorgeous and then you know that obviously took it up to to a whole other level like what what stood out to you being part of that uh, i mean the part i was out there for was one of their biggest scenes and i i can i can never remember the episode but it's it's basically where the white walkers and the wildlings and everybody clash and, and fight and it's it's the biggest battle scene in the entire series yeah. um the, the episode is just slipping my mind right now but it was one of the most intense on-set environments i've ever been in um <laughs> it, it was great you know i was there for multiple reasons they they wanted to use my water housing. Um, and so I was teching the water housing for them, building yeah. some things into it to make it work the way they wanted to. And, but then on top of that, um, at that point it was, it was a mixed bag of what cameras they were using. But that, uh, at that point they started really starting to heavily go towards putting a lot of reds on set. And then for this yes. giant, this giant battle scene, I mean, they had, gosh, I wish I could remember the accurate number, but I want to say it was like 17, um, 
red epics on set on the cranes wow. people running you know people dressed in full costume so they're part yeah. of the battle scene but what you can't see oh, is they've we... actually got a camera in their hand you know so oh, it's dude. the pov style stuff like that <laughs> uh, it was it was gnarly um yeah i mean to say the least we watched somebody i, I gotta say almost almost die where you know there's a point there's a point in the battle scene where all the wildlings are going and running off this dock and jumping into this big boat to try to escape and these boats are made out of real legit timber that they look like they could weigh a ton you know they at least and so when the last person jumps in to flip the boat over they've got a full-size construction crane overhead that just pulls two wires and flips the thing over so first take they did, uh, it knocked somebody out cold and he's trapped under the boat. Luckily, oh, they have plenty dude. of safety divers in the water who run oh, and get him yeah, out. Boy. He's totally unconscious still, you know, after yeah. being underwater, they get him. No, luckily, didn't have to resuscitate him, but you saw the look on his face like he'd just seen the light or maybe lack thereof, oh, which might be even more disturbing. <laughs> yeah, so uh, <laughs> that, that happened on the first take of that shot. And then there was uh. like... Okay, that cannot happen. This, that, and the yeah. other. There's, we, you know, but we're gonna try it one more time. One more time. <laughs> and go, they did it and, one more and time. We're gonna do one for safety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It just, was just intense. It was intense. Yeah, oh, God, it was intense that, yeah. that happens on every set. <laughs> yeah, I came back with pneumonia that I had for like two months after that shoot. It was, oh, yeah, we're man. you know up to our ankles, if not uh, knees deep in mud every single day, like an hour and a half north of uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland and wild, like in a rock quarry, just rugged, rugged situations. That's ridiculous. And so was, you've, you know, I mean, you've got a fairly phenomenal breadth of the work that you've done, you know, in terms of the sorts of stuff that you've been on, you know, from the nature to doco to, you know, run and gun to, you know, sort of as big as, as big as you can get. And then, you know, the, the part that I really want to lead into is, you know, towards your work because you've obviously you know uh now with you know base film and you know a lot of the work that you're doing now um i really want to lead into how it came to be that you managed to get yourself onto ocean x for their maiden voyage mm. is that yeah. a similar knocking on the door story or did they come to talk sort to you? of sort of but I, no they came to me but it was also after a long relationship with them i guess um before ocean x uh, existed it was Alusha productions which yeah. if you've seen blue planet 2 the opening episode where david attenborough is standing out on the front of a beautiful research vessel um that was the Alusha, and so i worked with them a couple times oh gosh this has to be six years ago or something like that maybe no more than that now and um it was helping integrate the camera systems in the submarines um, that was also being helped by John L. Brock, Brock from Gates. And so I worked with them back then and then continued talks with them throughout the years about certain projects. And then came to be, yeah, it um, after after leaving Red, you know, it was, you know, I was trying to make it known that I'm trying to go full pedal of the metal when it comes to the freelance world. And um, they came to me with something I regrettably had to say no to and then came back it came back to ask me okay so that was a test run that was kind of a working out the kinks thing but now that we've done that we're about to have our maiden voyage it's in the red sea in a part of the red sea which is um in saudi arabian waters in, off of off of neom which is this really interesting story in itself that i won't get too far into but it's 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 ocean area that has been inaccessible let's say to yeah. science to you know outsiders up until this time and they were trying to open it up and allow science to come in and do research and allow us to document this that was an amazing trip yeah it was overall we were on board for about seven weeks or so um i did wow. i did like 40 three days of diving scuba wow. diving where I was probably doing two to sometimes four dives a day um, when I wasn't doing that. Yeah. I was in the, in the submarines operating, you know, two cameras, one with a macro lens, one with the wide lens. And it's basically, you know, you, you, you're working with these big giant kind of gimbals and, and uh, follow focus units 
And if I wasn't doing that, then I was on board possibly operating the camera that was on the ROV. And yeah. we discovered amazing amounts of, of new species, but also like shipwrecks. And oh, that's wow. when I got my really first taste of truly brand new archaeological findings and filming and those like Indiana Jones stuff there. Like, oh. you know, I mean, like we, all want, we all want to be explorers, right? Like that's, man, who especially want to be, as a, man, I want to hat the whip and I want to go and totally, find the unknown. Totally. I mean, as Dude. a kid, you want to be an explorer, you want to be an astronaut. Totally. And you, I felt like doing both of them, you know what I mean? Because yeah. we were literally looking at something that nobody's ever seen before. And I'm fil- not only, and am I also filming it for the first time? And some of them I know yeah. still haven't been filmed again since. Wow. Um, but I've been back to that area a couple of times. I actually just got back uh, three weeks ago now, maybe a little over two yeah. weeks ago um, from the same area doing um, kind of similar work. It's more commercial work, but also at the same time, you're, you're focused around these, these new sites and these new areas that haven't been filmed before. Oh man. That like, and I can only imagine, you know, like the buzz on the ship, you know, each mm. time. You know, there's because how, how many people are on board? Like, how, how big is the crew? Oh, boy. On? Oh, hundreds, hundreds for sure. But there, I'm wondering, I'm trying to just remember how many scientists there were because there was, yeah. I want to say there was like 40 something scientists. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I was the only uh, underwater specific camera operator on board, which is oh. quite, a, quite a treat and quite a, an amount of pressure as well. But, oh, um, yeah. And then, who else do you talk camera tech with? I mean, like that's yeah. you know, whenever we're yeah. on the job, all we do is we sit around and we talk cameras. <laughs> well, sure. And then there's and then there's some topside crews, and and you know some of the big uh, stories they were trying to tell were following the scientists and the research they were doing yeah. out there. So you'd have some topside crew following them, oh, and cool. then I would follow oh, them so you underwater. Still talk tech with. Yeah, we still that's we important. still yeah shop talk. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's important. We still we still could nerd out, but yeah, it was it was incredible. <laughs> Because it like that stuff that I've seen of you know you I've seen photos of you in the submersible and um, yeah operating down under the water because I mean how do you find like what what's the transition between you know when you're working obviously holding a housing to then work is it is it similar to like doing you know helicopter work or how, how what, what's the yeah. translation there Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, cameras mounted on the outside of a submarine feels a lot like helicopter work, um, just yeah. not as rapid. You know, the gimbals and, like, you know, uh, I love doing heli work too, like aerials and then, like, a nice shot of a rig. But that's right. fast and reactive that's, and, yeah. you know, just yeah. so smooth. Whereas the submarine stuff, the way we were doing it at the time, at least, it's typically you're framing your shot and then you're communicating with the sub pilot and letting the sub do a lot of the work. So at, oh, really? whereas in, in aerial work, a lot of times we let the gimbal do the movement and – the position, the panning and the tilting or whatever the plan shot is. Whereas a lot of times I would try to get ourselves framed where we are now, where we want to be communicated with the sub pilot. A lot of times we would let the sub do a lot of the motion work. Or then mm-hmm. if it was the macro stuff, a lot of times it was just trying to get the sub settled, sitting still, not scaring a critter or, you know, of work. We had, we had lights that would come out on a retractable, uh, track oh, yeah. and things design, like that and yeah. try to try to backlight pieces of coral they discovered all kinds of new species of coral in the area discovered some brian pools uh shipwrecks like i was saying crazy stuff yeah. shipwrecks would be cool like when you see that under mm. the water, like that we were, were you under were you uh there was there was a couple there was multiple or? times yeah um wow. but without saying too much about one it was no, definitely cool. one of the biggest archaeological finds we had we saw the artifacts yeah. And we were filming the artifacts. And then when we went back down a second time, I kind of tried to follow the path of the artifacts. And then I saw the outline of a ship. I saw wow. the ship basically like a triangular oh, man. shape of a ship. And at this point, I'm still a little bit above it. You know, I'm about 15, 20 meters above it. And I know that thing is probably at about, I would let's say 30 meters and we're on nitrox, which is a mixed yeah. blend where it's a high, high amount of, of oxygen. So there's a certain point where you can't go deeper no. than your maximum, maximum operating depth or else you yeah. get oxygen poisoning basically. Yeah. And die. Okay. So I could tell that's pretty close to my MOD right there, but got down to it and got closer and could tell there were wood beams and then found the anchor 
And I, wow. at this at this point, I'm trying to communicate in hand signal in very excited hand signals. You got what I what I find totally, and I'm trying to say like you know as we as we were coming back up a little yeah. bit, trying to get out of out of that yeah. depth and and start working towards the artifacts again. I'm trying to tell them like, look, you, you look yeah, here. Do you see yeah. the shape? You yeah. see the shape, and, and nobody got it until we got back on board. And I pulled up the footage, and they're like, yeah. look, oh. Whoa. There it is. Yes, that's a ship. Okay. But yeah, that was that was an amazing moment. That it's was, that was wild. Your other thing, you'd be down there going, mate. I hope I'm not like tripping balls down here because you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, especially but, you yeah, do get you get narcosis. Like, oh, yeah. You, am I seeing yeah. things or is that yeah. like is that yeah. what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And narcosis is 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 often referred to as like being a little bit drunk. So yeah, you do kind of yeah. have to question yourself. Correct. But once going, once I, I found the like, anchor, it was. What's the fun yeah, anchor? It was, it was, you go, it, was like, look, it was a good personal moment. I'm like, okay, I'm okay. It's, it's definitely an anchor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, look, one of the other things I've got to, I've got to run past you is uh, <laughs> I am always me, super impressed uh, when you post photos of the work that you're doing in uh, the big tanks with NASA. Oh, cool. Yeah, like, that's yeah, man. The NASA stuff is just cool. <laughs> I mean, that you know. It, Whenever I see that, and, you know, obviously I know that there's so much that goes in and, you know, this is the highlight real stuff and there's so much mm. that goes into making all this happen. But, man, when I see those moments, I'm like, go, man, like, that is <laughs> like rock and roll. That is so uh, cool. You it, said it, though. Yeah, you don't, po- you, don't post, you don't post the bad times typically. Yeah. No, mate, you, you, no, you never do. It's the highlight reel. Um, yeah. But it's, it's imagining that phone call going – G'day, Sean. This is NASA. Uh, can you come and teach the astronauts some stuff? And you're like, did that just happen? Uh, it is like, the coolest environment. Yeah. I honestly cool. like and literally go into space. And this is, I this try is, to keep my yeah, I try to keep yeah, myself in like, check and not get too uh, yeah. you know, just blown away by the moments just I find myself in. But that's stuff. it's pretty hard not to just totally oh, geek out. Man. Yeah. The first time I went there was um about eight years ago and it was for a total different purpose than the last couple of times I've been um, where eight years ago I was there to film for a documentary called a year in space. It was uh, produced by time formerly time magazine. Um, they ended up selling it to PBS or however that works. It ended up winning an Emmy, which was really cool too. But that was the first time I was there and we're filming Scott Kelly's, last training sessions in the tank before he is wow. about to leave for Kazakhstan, go yeah. get in quarantine and then go into space for an entire year. First person to ever do it. And it just surreal does not, it uh, does not work for a word. <laughs> no, <laughs> just so tired time. That. It was there, very amazing though. It was so cool. It was, it was so cool. Um, but yeah, I've been lucky enough to go back two more times and they have a video department there that, you know, constantly they are recording video. They have a team that has these cameras that are wired into basically the um, mission control and mission control will be walking the astronauts through training scenarios about yep. what they are about to go up into the International Space Station and do like repairs let's say like oh, yeah. um one of the times that we were you know we were filming them basically replace these gigantic batteries that are you know the size of a small car um mm-hmm. stuff like that but what they can be doing also is and this is mind-blowing to me is they're walking through these scenarios and they're broadcasting that to the international space station to mm-hmm. walk the astronauts that are up there through the process of like, okay, we're going to walk through it here for you underwater in Houston, Texas at the Johnson space center. And then mm-hmm. you just go ahead and put your suit on and hop out there and do that in space now. Um, so that's, that's wild. wild. But the other, the other part of that scenario is they have a department that films things that are more for their promotional aspects. Um, of course. Yeah. I mean, they got so much cool stuff going on there, including, you know, now, they're they're working on the the lunar program where you know they're about to set up a, a moon base basically so you yeah. know big big portion of the neutral buoyancy lab um the nbl is is blacked off to try to keep it dark when they need it to be and yeah, wow. they've got this they've got this like kinetic sand on the bottom that's supposed to mimic the uh the sand on the moon if you to yeah, throw it in that amount of gravity yeah. 
So it doesn't, you know, just plume up and fill the whole water column. Oh, it's so wild. Yeah, a bunch of heroes over there. It's wild. That that is good. so. So that's the work that um, you got your Emmy for. That's that one. Is that correct? Uh, a year in a year in space. Yeah. yeah. yeah the year in space. And like, tell me about that experience. I mean, you know, I, I, what's what's that like? Having, have <sighs> I, I don't think as a as a creator, there is to me, there's nothing more wonderful than the acknowledgement of your peers. And that's sure. sort of a very high, you know, where your peers go, yeah, good work, Chief. Yeah. I mean, I got to say, I, I played a very small role in that yeah. very large project, but I'm so of proud course. to have done it. And also I just feel so blessed for the opportunity and the experience. Yeah, um, I get that. But yeah, I mean, amazing, amazing crew of documentary filmmakers um, that made the episodes and followed them out to Kazakhstan, did all the did all the real work of following him, Scott yeah. Kelly, through the human emotions of what he was about to do and the real human stories of it. And then I got to do a little more of the fun stuff of shooting it underwater. And But we, we made a real stylistic in, in a way that I haven't been able to do again, where, you know, it was, it was a much darker environment. We got to control lighting and, and well, do some cool. really fun stuff with that. And that would have been one of the biggest things because yeah, so much of what you do, you're working in, I guess, a live environment. Whereas mm. that would have actually been a controlled space where you could tinker with it and go, Oh, Hey guys, could we just try this? And sure. Sure. And typically in those way. scenarios we're like when I've been back the couple of times after it's for the most part, you're trying to stay out of the way. <laughs> the last yeah. thing you want to oh. do is all of a sudden yeah, an astronaut runs into the dome port of your housing because yeah. you're trying to get so this geez. close shot or something. Yeah. Ooh. I know you're doing yeah. something, but I'm trying to get a shot here. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. That, get, that it, one was fly on the wall. Stay back. Yeah. That one was, it, it was, it, it was, known that this is a big story about scott and so that there was a little more yeah. leeway to get experimental and ah, uh, yeah just an, inc an incredible situation i mean yeah, that's crazy. Uh, there's there's you know, I, there's 25 stories wrapped into the first hours of that shoot that i won't even get into imagine, at the moment but the rigs were going up into space too that was one of the things that was mm -hmm. happening was like the epics were going up into space and i remember seeing them you know, just in case it wasn't cool enough, like they're, they're <laughs> literally, you know, shooting them in space. And I'm like, yeah. oh, can you guys stop this? Like, that's just yeah. awesome. Because did you uh, have to do some of the training with the, with uh, some of the guys that took them up or? Those, you know, is really interesting. No, I, no, to be, to be short about that. But I mean, they had been trained and also like, they, yeah. The, the astronauts that go up there are already so technically minded and a lot oh, of them cool. are already photographers. Yeah. Nice. Um, but Terry and I know Terry's a big photographer and, and, and Scott himself was like, after the shoot we did in the tank, we went out and grabbed beers, you know, it was Scott's last night in town and he's got a million people to talk to. And he wanted to come over and talk to me about the red cameras. I'm like, this is so weird. Dude. <laughs> this is so Again, for real. Like that's, <laughs> yeah. You're yeah. like me, yeah. <laughs> but again, you know, if you love cameras, it's the same as what I was saying on Ocean X. You just need people there to mm. talk because you can talk mm. tech forever, is what I have found with my <laughs> you know, whenever I travel with crews, like we go yeah. and have a few beers and we just talk cameras for hours. Yeah. So it's and it's when you're around the people that don't care about that stuff, that's when you really yeah. realize it because, like, oh my gosh, are you oh, mate, you see the eyes roll back in the head, and <laughs> like, can you idiots shut up? Yes. Like, what? This is the best. We're, we're, yeah. we're actually we're terrible to go to the cinema with as well. If you're, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Totally. like, mm, look at the richness of those blacks, and they're there going, what is wrong with mm. you? <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, it's, it's really funny because my, my wife is one of her favorite sayings. Is I'll go like, oh my god, that looks like crap. She goes, oh, did did they not crush the blacks enough? I'm like, oh, that's, thanks, Stop babe. That's cute. She's got these little, she's got these little bits. She's she and she's always heard me, you know, complain yeah. about and stuff or uh, watching movies. Mate, we are all the same now. But I'm also a writer, so unfortunately, I can I feel like most things I watch, I've seen two minutes of it, and I could tell you exactly how this whole thing can yeah. go, <laughs> and that's the See, worst. That, that, I know I that, need to shut up. <laughs> that makes it tough. Yeah. Now. With the work that you're doing now, so you, you're obviously, um, mate, you, you're pursuing the passion. You've gone all in to indeed doing your own thing. Yeah, indeed, man. Um, and loving it. You know, I've been really, really blessed to have some regular clients and, you know, some some companies like Base Films who I've been working with a good bit. Um, going back to Neom at least once a year for the past three years, which has been incredible. Um, but also doing some cinema work that, 
like to me, you know, my, my heart and, and my childhood energy, my childlike energies, uh, I should say, and, and everything, it's still always going to be in nature. It's going to be in the ocean, yeah. but I love doing cinema work. Like I, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 that, that's also another part of me where I thought I would be a feature film director until I actually spent enough time on feature film sets and realized, yeah. oh, I don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, so to be a specialty operator, you know, to be able to come in yeah. and sometimes yeah. just day play, if not, you know, two, three days on, you know, a, a four or five month project. And get some specialty shots for them. That is, that's my favorite. I love that's it. Just the right amount because yeah. you don't have to suffer through the whole process. You just <laughs> get to rock into a bit and then leave. And go, see you guys. Have fun. Totally. And I'm and I'm down for the longer term projects, of course, too. But there is something special about when it's a um a small kind of concentrated, concise effort of yeah. we know we have to get this, and it is a specialty type of thing, you know. Then the efforts that go into it and, and everything and the attention that go oh, into yeah. it. And then again, the pressures involved with it too. Oh, it's amazing. like, okay, well, got to get this done now. The opportunity to do your best work is to yeah, go, yeah. That, you know, this is it. You need to give all your attention to this one thing. You don't have to divide it across, you know, a great many yeah, and, yeah, you know, just put all, all your knowledge, all your skills into making that exceptional. Mm, absolutely. Because if you've, has, has any of that work really, have you noticed a change in the way that you approach your work over these last couple of years now that it's, you know, you for you? Um, I, I don't know if it's changed in just because it's me doing it from a freelance perspective versus, yeah. you know, when I was at Red, a lot of times I was doing my freelance work during my vacation time. <laughs> so cool. every vacation day was basically spent doing that type of thing. Um, but my work has changed through my own progression for my own experience and um, what I've learned over time, a hundred percent, you know, it's, yeah. it's always maturing. I want to say it's always um, progressing and uh, some of that also ends up happening way before you hit the water, you know, just my knowledge base is I'm trying to constantly expand my knowledge base and, and training so that, you know, when somebody tells me, you know, there's this crazy scenario we want to shoot in this specific way. I can, I could pre-plan on how to set it up for success versus try to guess and, and hopefully make it happen. Um, shooting the opening s- sequence to a movie, the colony, which is yeah. on Netflix. Um, that's the whole uh, uh, opening sequence is an underwater setup. And it was being shot on these Hawk anamorphics um, with a yeah. vintage 65, you know, full frame lenses. And there was only one set that existed in the entire world and oh, they're wow. being used on this show. So there's no way I could test before I get out to Germany to shoot this or anything oh, like that. Cool. It was literally just trying to come in with what I could pre-plan, what yeah. I have known, what, questions I could ask to my peers and my mentors and kind of come in and make it all work. And somehow I did, (laughs) but, but it was, you know, there was, there was, you know, you're talking about just to physically make the thing fit. There's not a millimeter left over of space in certain areas on the gears and things like that to make it all fit. But then just to make it fit is one thing Uh, to make it optically perform properly. And, and yeah, it's, so you know challenges like that are are they're 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 fun so it's you yeah. know it's that's that's the mental game of it all too instead of just the physical Big game stress. Well, oh, and yeah. that is it isn't it it's it's that mental mm-hmm. preparation where you and, and i'm sure you're the same you know where i i'll spend you know whatever the job is i'll spend days weeks months you know thinking through the job thinking through you know absolutely like even even like even this stuff that I do here, like the amount of work you put into testing a setup, you know, just to make sure it works. And you go to bed thinking about it going, Oh, what if I did that cable? And what if I split yeah. this? And what if I tried that? <laughs> like you just, you just can't help yourself. Can you like this? So you, you know, could be thinking about it for months and those, those thoughts right there are definitely going to pop up the night before, especially the night before getting on an airplane or something like that. Oh, totally. Yeah, Cause you try to make sure, because this is one of the funniest things, and it's something I've actually never understood about myself. I'm actually like super forgetful and, you know, a bit of a shambles. But when it comes to like packing my kit, mm. like I can remember like down to the screw totally. what is required because yeah. I do like a mental build in my head 
and then I'll lay it all out and then pack it all away. And I've I've never understood how I can have like such a photographic <laughs> memory yeah. when it comes to camera gear. I have never understood that. I am exactly with you. Honestly, every every trip I pr- I pack for, I'm I kind of step back eventually. I'm kind of blown away. Like, whoa, how did that just happen? And it's yeah. some of it is so automatic. I know I'm I've, yeah. I've already thought it out months in advance, and I've already sometimes done it before and been through it, even though some of the elements might change. But then I get everything perfectly packed, perfectly fit. There's not a millimeter mm-hmm. to spare in this case and I weigh it and it's literally, you know, a gram, gram or two underneath yep. the, the, the weight one. allowance. I'm like, I've got the scales. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it amazing, blows. Yeah. Like, I, I find that I do. I find that endlessly weird. Yeah. Having that super bizarre skill set that I don't have for anything else. Like, yeah, it, yeah. I can't apply it to very much else in my life. Too, else yeah. in my life <laughs> yeah. Yeah, except totally. You know, when I pack, because, you know, and you'd be the same, whenever you're doing international trips, you know, sometimes you have trouble with what you can take in and what you can fly and what you, True. and I, like, it is so, I'm, I'm trying to actually think of an occasion where I've forgotten something mm. and like, I don't think I it know. exists. I second guess myself the whole way, but then I, I, yeah. I once I'm there and I, I and I prep everything it's, and set it up and. Weird. And and then and then I remind myself, I'm like, yeah, you made checklists and you've done this a million times. And you know, you've yeah, you've you've, you've had sleepless nights staying up thinking about these things already. So that's why. Correct. We, whether we know it or not, we are constantly working on it and we're training ourselves. It's just yeah. I think kind of yeah. It's, it's, well, it it's obsessive. Weird. And it comes back to that point where I go, you know, this is a terrible life choice. Um, but you know, if you're all <laughs> in, if you're fully committed, it actually ends up being like the greatest adventures of your whole life. Right. And, you know, and, and this is the nice very part true. is, you know, and I've got to thank you for this because, you know, you've played a very big part in that for me, um, in oh. particular, how you managed to wrangle me into some of the red parties at, uh, um, when, when uh. I was over there for Cinegear and, you know, uh, not too similar to yourself. I'm like, Hey, Sean, Hey, Sean, Hey, Sean, Hey, Sean, <laughs> can, you, can you get me in? <laughs> yeah, totally. I, I love it. I love it. Uh, the relentlessness, mate, when I want something. No, there was, um, there was. Yeah, there was never a doubt, though. Hold on, I'm not going. No, He's there, not going. No, there, I'm not. <laughs> Scott's I, getting I'm, in. I'm getting in. I'm getting in. Because I remember watching, like, the year before I'd thought about going, and I remember watching uh, a live stream. I think Jared was actually posting something, and he was letting off fireworks in the car oh, park. Yeah. And I, rem- yeah. I was sitting in my lounge room at home with my wife, and I'm like, man, I could have been there watching this loose cannon, <laughs> you know, shoot fireworks. And then 12 <sighs> months later, I was standing there watching that loose cannon, um, yeah. you know, shooting off fireworks at red. And I'm like, man, in this person, is my dream's coming yes. true. Like, I'm yes. literally living this dream. Yeah, that ended up becoming a tradition. Yeah. Man, was- it's a tradition. And then, like, the next year, is, and and you see, I was, oh, my God. I, and, and, and it was ending up chatting it was the fact that I'd be there with all these people that I knew from the internet that, right. you know, and I'd known from red user and stuff that, you know, like absolute just superstars of the game. And mm. I'm there like having beers with them and talking shop totally. with them. And, and you're just there going, this is just crazy. Yeah. It's so, I mean, so cool professionally too, from a networking standpoint, but not that any of us were thinking about that at the moment. Cause no. we're just all coming together with like a similar spirit. And like, like you said too, you know, we all kind of jumped in with with red and and in digital cinema and in in this industry in general with this kind of uh, this optimism of I'm gonna effing do it. It's just gonna happen no matter what. It's just gonna happen. Um, and so yeah, the the vibes are all similar between everybody, it's, it's and it's, it's a celebration of the vibe. Yeah, yeah. Well, good, uh, to make something of yourself, you know, in this industry, there's no other way. Like mm. if you are not obsessive and relentless, you know, with absolute singular focus like you you won't do it and i've watched people try to get into it that and you can see the half-heartedness from them mm. and mm. and they're the ones that you know 12 months later are, are, are long gone yeah, but it's yeah. that yeah, yeah that yeah. that fincher mindset where you're looking at the footpath going no 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 that's that's the one. Indeed. Oh, now, look, my dude, I'm very conscious of your time. Um, but okay. I just, if people want to follow you, follow your adventures, all the cool stuff mm-hmm. you do, if they want to, you know, get you out on their next uh, on the on their next big feature, how, how do we follow 
Mr. Sean Rogeri around the internet. Love it. Thanks for the plug. Yeah. Um, telepathyproductions.com is my website. Um, got some samples of my work. I'm so long overdue to sit down and finish a reel I've got to do. Um, but telepathyproductions.com and uh, snap a map on Instagram. Snap a map. Uh, <laughs> I don't stay as active as I need to be on there nowadays, but yeah. You just got to post I... the cool stuff you do, but yeah, it takes so totally. much time. Like when you got that dad life and the husband you life know. and the the self-employed life. I, I get you, man. That's, you know, it's hard work. What I'll do is I'll throw links to all those things. So if people want to find you and track you down and chat stupid things, then uh, they, they can it. find you that way. But Love Sean, it. I'm so grateful, my man. When, when are we going to see you in Australia next? Have you any, anything? Oh, on the I got to get back. Uh, I don't yet, but I've got to get back. I miss you all over there. I just yeah, miss boy. that beautiful land of yours. Uh, Mate, and I've got, got yeah, sooner or later. What's that? And, uh, there's uh, some wrecks at Morton Island, like oh yeah, yeah, less than yeah. 60 minutes from. Oh, you've probably I already know. dived them. Nope, uh, I'm not. Man, but, uh, oh well, when you come over next time, I'm going to take you over there and we're going diving on the wrecks. Love it, I love it. Yes, I'll, I, I'll I appreciate your program. time too, Scott. Thanks so I'll, much I'll for having me on, man. Too. I am so stoked, mate. I'll uh, uh, thank you, Sean. This has been the most wonderful conversation, and I, I appreciate <laughs> you. you, my friend. Thank you. And I will see you over there soon. Uh, I want some barbecue and beer and see your beautifully mate. manicured lawn. Barbecue, beers, and lawn, mate. You know it. Bit of putt-putt out the back. <laughs> I cannot wait, yeah. my friend. <laughs> All right. Thanks, <laughs> brother. <laughs> Take care, Scott. Oh. Thank you.